Welcome back to our study of the book of Hebrews. Last week, we went through the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11. We saw the qualities that make for faith. Now, this week, the Hebrew writer is going to bring all of that to a point, to a conclusion, and finish up this admonition that he's making on that basis. Uh, so turn with us as we begin our text in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are so uh, surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So the Hebrew writer wraps up his discussion of the faithful by turning its lessons on us. All right, so he calls all of these faithful people that we've just seen in Hebrews chapter 11, he says that they are a great cloud of witnesses. Well, in what sense are they witnesses? There are a couple of different ways that the Bible uses the language of witness. Um, first, someone can be a witness to people about certain truths. Right? In this sense, the faithful of Hebrews chapter 11 are witnessing to us about the nature of faith so that we can run the race ourselves. Right? They're, they are um, demonstrating to us what faith is. That's certainly bound up in what the Hebrew writer has just said. Um, the, uh, the word witness can also denote a person who is watching you, right? So in this sense, the departed faithful um, are watching us as we are running that race that is set before us, right? Uh, we we often think of the departed faithful in this way as a, a great cloud of witnesses. In other words, they are living in heaven and they are actually watching us uh, and kind of cheering us on, rooting for us. Um, neither one of those, by the way, is exclusively required by the text. Um, and I think it's useful to have both of those things in mind. Both of those things are allowed by the text. Uh, but we're supposed to look at the faithful um, it, we're supposed to look to the faithful um, who have gone on before us as examples so that we can learn how to be faithful. But we should also take courage. We should take heart that they are looking down at us. Right? We get this idea from other places as well. Right? This isn't just some, uh, some idea that's been imported you know, from outside of Scripture. We have this, this kind of thing shown to us in like Revelation. Uh, where all of the, the departed saints are still aware of what's going on here on earth um, and are also, in fact, aware of uh, the prayers that are being offered. Right? We find that all over Revelation. Uh, we find similar awareness in, you know, say, uh, like the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, is the rich man is still aware of his brothers uh, whom he's left behind on earth and wants to go back as a, a witness to them after a fashion. Um, but both of those senses of witness are, are legitimate, and I think we should keep those in mind. That we should be looking at the departed faithful, and we should also recognize that the departed faithful are looking at us. Um, but the capstone of this whole list is Jesus himself. That he's not just the great high priest who presents himself in the true holy place. He's not just the king of kings who sits at the right hand of the Father on high. He's not just the final prophet through whom the Father has spoken to us. He's also one of us. He is the greatest example of enduring faith. So you have all of these exemplars of the faith, and, and, and having them watching us should inspire us to strong faith ourselves. The, the Hebrew writer admonishes us, do what they did. Get rid of impediments. Avoid sin. Notice, by the way, that 
he doesn't just admonish us to stay free of sin, but he also says, let us lay aside every weight that is, you know, every impediment, everything that gets in the way of you reaching the prize, right? There are lots of things in this life that are not sinful in and of themselves, but they can impede our progress in the faith if we let them. Uh, in that case, we become like the seed cast among thorns, where the cares and concerns of this world choke out the word. That literally anything can become the cares and concerns of this world. But we focus our sights on matters, which is why the Hebrew writer encourages us to look to Jesus, to consider what he endured so that we don't grow weary or faint-hearted. Because look, if we're focused on the cares and concerns of this world, if we're focused just on our own lives, even if we are trying to live those lives in faith, we're focused just on our own life and our own conduct in the faith, we're going to give up eventually. All right? The world is going to wear us down. That's what the Hebrew writer's audience is at risk of. Uh, Jesus shows us what we ought to think about the worst that the world can throw at us. The ESV translates uh, what Jesus does as despising the shame that he endures on the cross. Which I think obscures the meaning here, uh, because in English the word despise carries the sense of hatred with it. That's not what the Hebrew writer is trying to get across. Uh, the Greek word that he uses here means considering something to be nothing. In other words, Jesus' attitude about the world's shame that he endured at the cross is that he didn't care about it. That's not what he was looking at. Um, and that's the way that we need to treat the world's hardships. right? It's like I don't know, some pesky little thing that's just desperate for our attention and we're not going to give it attention, right? These things, are they should be meaningless to us. And so we are to be like Christ. And we're, and we're to look at his example. And we are to look at the prize that's set ahead of us. We're not to be looking at, they're focused on these worldly trials, these worldly temptations. Now, at this point, the Hebrew writer pivots. Sorry, he's been using this metaphor of running a race. And, and by the way, going back to what we said about the great cloud of witnesses uh, and the potential to interpret that as, you know, departed saints looking down from, uh, from where they're at and still being aware of what's going on on earth. That phrase, great cloud of witnesses, was commonly used uh, in antiquity to describe the... Uh, the spectators at a race. There's a reason why the uh, the Hebrew writer uses that kind of language here. He's built this metaphor. We are running a race. We are trying to endure to the end. Now he's going to shift gears a little bit. Right, he pivots around this idea that his audience has not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Right, Read in the context of those first three verses, this means they're not running hard enough. Right, No pain, no gain, as it were. Right? You don't tell me that you're tired running until you've really shown that you're tired. But this statement about shedding their own blood also belongs with the next paragraph. So we're going to pick up with verse 4 again and read forward through verse 11. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one whom he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there for whom his father uh, what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. 
Right? We ought to expect hardship in the faith because God disciplines us as sons. That's the next metaphor here. And the Hebrew writer proves that from Proverbs. The proverb that he's citing from is uh, chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Now, the ESV renders this word discipline. All right, he, uh, he quotes it. Um, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Um, which, again, potentially might obscure the meaning here. In English, discipline uh, can uh, imply punishment. Right, there's some punitive um, aspect to this. That's not what's in mind here. Um, both in the Hebrew writer's Greek and in Solomon's Hebrew, when you go back to Proverbs 3.11, um, this, what this verse is talking about is not punishment. It's talking about instruction or education. It's discipline in that sense. It's formation. The immediate point is that God, first off, God's not even trained them that hard, right? You've, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. God's training you, but he's actually taking it kind of easy on you. But you should expect hardship if you're going to call yourself a son of God, right? If, if the Hebrew writer's audience, and if those of us that are discouraged by worldly trials you know if if we didn't receive training from the father then we would be illegitimate sons right? illegitimacy was very very common in antiquity but only legitimate sons could inherit and so from the perspective of your typical ancient patriarch only the legitimate sons are worth educating right it takes it takes a lot of resources a lot of effort to educate someone, especially whenever you consider that, you know, your legitimate sons are being trained for a particular station in life. Now, that's what you're passing down to them. Um, and so you educate them. Illegitimate sons had no station. They received no inheritance. It wasn't worth educating them. And so they were largely left to their own devices. Uh, that's why, you know, the other word for illegitimate child uh, ultimately, you know, came to mean a person of low character. That, that illustrates the point. The Hebrew writer has spent a whole chapter showing us the kind of character that the people of the Messiah are supposed to have. And how do you get that kind of character? Right? Abraham does not just kind of blindly wander into the faith. Neither does Moses. You know, neither did David or Samuel. They weren't just left to their own devices and then, oh, just all of a sudden on accident, they wound up being you know, exemplars of the faith. They undergo all kinds of formation over the course of their lives. They are formed into these fathers of faith that we count them to be. And so we also should submit ourselves to the father's instruction, just as they did. Because unlike our earthly fathers, our heavenly father is perfect. His instruction invariably turns to our good. And so we, have, we must endure it. Even if it seems unpleasant in the moment, because we know that good fruit is going to come of it. All right, so the Hebrew writer has used these two metaphors to describe our experience here on earth. It's like we're running a race. It's like we're being trained by a, a loving father who is preparing us to receive our station in life and to receive our inheritance. The Hebrew writer then brings both of these metaphors together as he calls us to endure. That's the central message of both of these metaphors, is endurance. Let's pick up our text again in chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore... Lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, 
that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Okay, so the image that we're given, I mean, again, he's used two metaphors for us, and he's joining them together here. So we're given a couple of images here. We can imagine a runner who is growing tired in the race, or a son who is just sick of his father's demanding training. The Hebrew writer's message, and by the way, we're, we're supposed to put ourselves in their shoes. The Hebrew writer's message for us is chin up, All right? Buck up. Quit goofing around. Make a beeline for the goal. Right? Get it together. The Hebrew writer reveals that a big part of getting in shape for the struggle of faith is to reframe it as something other than struggle. He says, we're to be at peace. We're to be at peace with others, and we're to be at peace within ourselves. That's the sense of this warning against the root of bitterness springing up, because it can be easy. Again, go back to that metaphor of the sun who's being disciplined by his father. Right? How many stories have we heard you know, that center around you know, this son who is just sick of receiving discipline from his father? He becomes bitter towards his father and acts out in some, you know, some kind of rebellion. You know, no one is doing you wrong just because the faith is hard. God's not doing you wrong. Right? The church isn't doing you wrong just because you know, the faith gets hard for you sometimes. Now, in saying that, uh, we need to ensure that we're not actually, as the church, doing anyone wrong. Right? The Hebrew writer speaks of this as a group effort. Right? See to it that no one fails. See to it that the root of bitterness doesn't spring up, because the results of someone's bitterness can be pretty far-reaching and can damage the whole church. But the root message is, be strong. Right, you know, lift up your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees. Be strong because the promise is drawing near. Right? This is all tied in, by the way, with what the Hebrew writer has said about Jesus. That Jesus didn't go into the shadow of the holy places, but the actual holy places themselves. And he did that to open the way for us. Right? That's that's the force of what he has to say starting in verse 18. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape when we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. All right, so here, the Hebrew writer brings up another shadow of the true holy place, Mount Sinai. Right, the holy mountain of God was a meeting place, 
but it was also a place of fear. And the Hebrew writer quotes from this prohibition against touching the mountain. If even a beast touches the mountain, you're to put it to death. All right, Mount Sinai was another place like the tabernacle that emphasized distance between man and God. Anything touches the mountain, put it to death, and put it to death from a distance, God says. Now, God did speak directly to Israel from the mountain, but they couldn't bear to hear it. It was so terrible. And so they begged Moses to intercede for them. Right, now, the Hebrew writer points, uh, brings all of that out to say, look, that's not what we have in front of us. That's not where we're headed. We're headed for something far better. We're headed for something accessible. Right, through Christ, we're headed for the actual Mount Zion. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That is, Christ's blood, he says, forgiven, right, instead of crying out for vengeance. The image is that we are going to the city that Abraham and the patriarchs were looking for, which the Hebrew writer talked about back in Hebrews chapter 11. And the whole point of all of this is that we have come very close to receiving these promises. The Hebrew writer phrases it, in, in fact, in the perfect tense, you have come. He, sp he speaks of this proleptically. That's because Christ has already opened the way. It's right there in front of us. Right, to go back to the, the metaphors he's been using, to that race metaphor, it's like we've rounded the last corner or crested the last hill, and we can see the finish line right there in front of us. Right Now, is that the point at which you quit the race? No. You press on. It doesn't matter how tired you are. It doesn't matter how worn out you are. It doesn't matter. I mean, even if you have overdone it and your, your knees hurt and your ankles hurt, you because know, you've had poor form or something. You keep running. Even if you've got to shuffle across that finish line, get there, whatever it takes. The Hebrew writer says we are on the cusp of something far greater than the old system could promise. And so get there. Finish. Don't give up. We are also looking at something far more dreadful than what was under the old system. He says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Right, we are looking at something final. Yet once more, the Hebrew writer says. Right, the Hebrew writer opened the whole book by talking about, you know, the different times and the different means by which God has spoken. And then he says, In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. God says that his voice will shake things one last time. That means whatever falls will have fallen forever. Whatever stands will stand forever. And so we must take care to accept God's promises while we can, because we're, we're looking at that city that Abraham and the patriarchs were looking for. It's right there in front of us. It's going to stand forever. And we just have to get to it, not give up on the way there. And so that is the call for, uh, that, that's, that's the Hebrew writer's admonition. From this text we've seen we've seen those of faith who've gone on before us we have seen Jesus right the, the beginning and end of our faith we've seen how they acted it's it's just up to us to act the same way to make it to that goal as they did. Well, thank you once again for joining us. Next week, we're going to conclude our study of the book of Hebrews, 
And then the Sunday following, we will begin a study of the book of uh, possibly Joshua, possibly Judges. Um, I, I know a lot more about Judges. I know Judges a lot better than I know Joshua. Um, but we have recently you know, finished um, a study of the Law of Moses. And so like the next logical thing in the history of Israel would be Joshua in talking about the conquest of the land. So I'm still deciding on that. Um, we will, at that point, whether I choose Joshua or Judges, uh, we're going to be broadcasting from the auditorium as uh, here at 14th Avenue, we tentatively resume our Sunday morning Bible classes. And I say tentatively um, because you know we don't know well, as I'm recording this, you know, a lot of our numbers have been going up, and we don't know what state and local governments are going to do in response to those increased numbers. And of course, you know, we as a congregation also, you know, we always reserve the right to um, to discern and judge things as we, you know, think best fits uh, best best fits the situation. Um, so, if uh, you know, if things go south. Who knows? Uh, what, what we're saying is that we don't know the future. Um, so we are planning on resuming our auditorium study. Um, and, you know, we pray for the future, but we continue to remain flexible. So with that, I wish you a happy Lord's Day, a blessed week. Lord willing, we will see you next week as we finish up the book of Hebrews. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.